Good morning. Um, as, uh, let's, we should uh, go ahead and get started uh, as um, uh, we have an exciting case uh, that's being uh, um, and sort of a topic being presented uh, today. Um, my name is Darshan Mehta. I'm the Associate Director of Education for the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine here at the Brigham. And it's really my honor to present my esteemed colleagues um, who uh, will be presenting uh, a case on integrated and the integrative headache management. Uh, my colleagues are Dr. Carolyn Bernstein, who is um, Associate Neurologist and Department of Neurology here and is also, uh, is also uh, uh, based at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Donald Levy, who's a medical director for the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Megan Searle, who's a clinical neuropsychologist and at the Center for Brain Mind Medicine. Meredith Beaton Starr, who is the integrative health coach at the Osher Center. And Matt Kowalski, who is a um, chiropractor at the Osher Clinical Center and president of the New England Spine Institute. So with that, Carrie. Thank you. And I want to say, uh, most importantly, we have our patient, Sarah, who is joining us today. And I'm really excited to be part of this model, to have my colleagues from the Osher Center and um, some of the people that we've worked with and Sarah here to describe our own experience. So we're going to talk about um, integrated and integrative headache management. So headache is a term that means a lot of different things to different people. Um, what we're focusing on specifically is migraine. And when I was fortunate enough to join the Brigham, so I worked part-time at the John Graham Headache Center and then part-time at the Osher Center for Integrative Therapies, I was very excited about being able to use integrative therapies and to weave them into care of patients with migraine. Migraine is different than headaches specifically. It's a complicated neurologic disorder that involves many different parts of the body. It can be completely disabling. I could spend many hours here telling you about that. Um, I want to just define it quickly. It is a headache that is usually one-sided. It is throbbing in nature. It is moderate to severe intensity. We use that scale of 1 to 10 pain, with 10 being so bad that you just can't move. That's people feel like they need to go to the emergency room at that point. A lot of patients with migraine have constant, frequent, severe pain. And accompanying that, you have to have either nausea and vomiting or light and sound sensitivity. From migraine itself, we talk about chronic migraine, which is a migraine that lasts at least 15 days out of the month. The strict definition of that is that five, uh, eight days are migraine themselves, and then the other days can be headache or what I call migraine hangover. And our uh, person, patient, collaborator today suffers from chronic migraine and has really dealt with the severe disabling neurologic pain condition. And I'm really um, honored that she's agreed to be part of this discussion and to describe her experiences with our integrated approach to her management. Um, I want to reference this. I think it may be small. I'll read it out loud. This just came out about a month ago. Um, this was in JAMA. And the title of it is, it's a, a perspective, as the opiate Opioid epidemic rages, complementary health approaches to pain gain traction. And that's something that my colleagues and I at the Osher Center talk about quite frequently. For managing pain, headache pain in particular, opiates are not a very good answer. They don't really help the pain. They don't really treat the migraines very well. Basically, they make people feel tired. They may bring the edge down. But there really need to be other holistic approaches to managing the pain. And that's what we really tried to work through in terms of setting up some new approaches. So traditional approach to headache management, we talk about medication, preventive. Those would be things that you do on a daily or frequent basis to try to prevent the headaches. We talk about abortive medications that somebody can take when they get a headache. One class some of you may be familiar with is the tryptan medications. Those are pills, tablets, injections that can stave a headache off when it's just started. But for somebody who has chronic frequent migraines, they're not particularly helpful because sometimes it's hard to tell where one headache begins and the next ends. We talk about trigger management. So what can we do in terms of lifestyle um, to help people have regular sleep, to make sure that they're eating well, they're hydrating? Those are some 
facets that are important in headache management, but they're not everything. We talk about comorbidity. What my um, former uh, uh, colleague, um, Dr. Lou Kaplan, used to talk of as the ecology of the patient, a term I really like. So is something else going on? For example, is somebody with migraines dealing with uh, depression or high blood pressure or another condition that may make the migraines more difficult to treat? We try to get patients to keep diaries when they can. And for anybody who's ever kept a diary, you know that it's a real pain in the neck to do it. Um, that iPhone tools make it a little bit easier, but it's hard to be meticulous about that. So there's a place for all these elements, but are they enough? And in my way of thinking about migraines, I've never felt that they were enough. So what else is important? There's a, a really key factor, I think, with chronic disease, with pain conditions in particular, this cycle of anxiety. And basically, you can see the different components, blue, worry, green, the belief system, red, over control, which is a little bit punitive. I'm not sure I like that term that much. Um, but then pink, look at the trigger and the panic. When you have headaches this frequently, I use this analogy that, that it's, it's like you're just standing at the edge of the ocean, looking at the waves, waiting for the big one that's going to come and knock you out. So it's going to just keep coming and coming and coming. And you get into a real vicious cycle. And so what are some things that we can do to interrupt that? Treatment of pain really responds to the collective experience of the group. And by that, what I mean is that having a shared experience of one's pain condition can actually give you tools to manage the pain differently. And that's part of what we were focusing at with our, our integrative therapies. So this is an article that I really like, and I just want to reference it. It's the passing dilemma in socially invisible diseases, which is one way that I think we can all think about um, migraines and a number of different pain conditions. These are some narratives on chronic headache. I'm, I'm quite interested in, in narrative medicine and in people's experiences of what the pain does to their life. And these were all stepping stones for some of the, the work that we planned together at the Osher Center to try to offer patients some alternatives beside traditional headache management. So today we have Sarah with us, um, and um, we have reviewed all of these and have her permission to uh, give you some of this information. She is a person with chronic migraine, that very frequent a uh, cycle of migraines occurring at least 15 days out of the month. I am treating her with Botox, which are injections that are done into the head in a set schema that can really help to decrease the pain, basically by slowing down the release of some of the neuroinflammatory triggers. Um, but the Botox treatment, while it helped, and I'll, I'll let her describe this a little bit more, was not really enough. I felt like there were a lot more components that we could really think about as a group, including her in this group holistically to try to, to, try to be uh, uh, helpful with her, her migraines. And so these are some of the things that we're going to talk about today with my, with my colleagues and with Sarah. Um, she had an integrative medicine consult with Dr. Levy, who's going to speak after I do. And I'm very excited that with my wonderful colleagues at the Osher Center, we've been able to set up workshops that are um, going to be described by Meredith Beatonstar, who is the health coach and director of these workshops, but to give people really a, a toolbox to really teach them integrative therapy techniques that they can use at home and to do this in a group so that patients who are learning these, these tools rather than one-on-one -on -one can actually have the shared experience of the group and hear from other people with migraines how they manage their life. And so this is really revolutionary. I, I, I don't know of other facilities that are doing quite this, this kind of uh, work and offering these. And it's been very exciting. We just finished our second um, three-part workshop, and I'll let Meredith describe this. And we also, um, thanks to Megan Searle, our neuropsychologist offered an acceptance and commitment therapy group that I described to people as um, mindfulness for pain. And I'll let her talk about that a little bit more. So with no further ado, my next colleague, Dr. Levy, is going to tell you a little bit about his approach. Oops, wrong button. So I was uh, I was asked to see Sarah because she was quite is this working? She was quite interested in looking at her entire way of taking care of her health. So twice a year I get to reiterate what our clinic sees as integrative medicine, which is really uh, therapeutic lifestyle changes as the preferred approach to any problem, as the first intervention to enhance our innate ability to heal, which is already a controversial subject. If you look in the history of medicine. This is a great historian's uh, work on medicine in general. Speaking about Western medicine, 
And I love this part that it says it's formally at least in large measure broken with the traditional wisdom of the body and then follows it with therein lies its strengths and its weaknesses. <coughs> so this traditional wisdom of the body I guess is that idea from the many centuries that there's an innate healing force of wisdom of the body and in breaking with that something happens that's good and maybe not so great and it raises the question for me should a clinician be more like a gardener or a mechanic? Um, mechanics fix broken parts. They see broken parts. They're precise. They don't care as much about the whole person, but the whole person is certainly included. Gardeners have to do a lot more. I'm learning gardening, and I'm not very good. And uh, you really have to pay attention to a lot of aspects because the plant just won't. I if you do it right, the plant has resilience and takes care of itself. Uh, if you don't, you don't get very good garden like I do. Uh, hopefully, I'm a better doctor. But it, the idea of gardening is different than than mechanics, and I think we need both in medicine. If you fall off a truck, Western medicine is the best. If you bang your head, we can put things back together in ways that were never dreamed of. But then there's a patient that needs tending and gardening. So uh, I, we think that uh, integrative medicine has some things in, co in you know, in similarities to gardening, and I put them on the on the on the slide here, we pay attention to these various other aspects of a human being and helping them get well for whatever the mechanical broken part happens to be. So Sarah saw me uh, mostly for general medical approaches to her problems and to make it short, I'll, some of the modalities we talked about, <clears throat> she had just come from this amazing three-part headache course that we had started to offer and was very enthusiastic about it. She learned some wonderful things about chiropractic there and I, we suggested she was going to continue with chiropractic. I thought a lot of how she uses and sits, stands, and uses her body was important, and the Alexander technique might fit her just right. I won't go into exactly what that is, but she might. Um, she already was me meditating, practicing yoga. She'd started to change her diet, which I strongly encouraged and suggested the simplest thing was just what she had done. Just stop sweets and refined grains. You're 90% there on just about any diet if you do that. Um, we did talked about magnesium and riboflavin that are used as sort of alternative medical but mainstream at times uh, approaches to mod modifying headaches. And again, 90 days is, is a therapeutic trial and things like that. If it doesn't work, stop it. We'll try something else. I saw her one other time about, we, I think I saw her in July and then a couple months later. She had already started the Alexander Technique with Kitty Breen, a, a terrific teacher in Cambridge, and wanted to continue. She loved Dr. Kowalski's exercises that he had given her in the course. Um, she was practicing yoga and meditation. She was probably going to continue chiropractic at the Tufts Craniofacial Center. I think that it worked out better for her. She was paying renewed attention to her diet, which was great. Um, supplements, it gave her, she was starting the magnesium and riboflavin. She had a new, a new dis thing we discussed about her. Sleep was interrupted and did not want to use medication, so we talked about a chamomile supplement and a study that showed chamomile versus Ativan uh, comparing favorably with less side effects. And finally, she wanted to bring up her cholesterol, and which is interesting is that her cholesterol was elevated, but with the lack of any other uh, risk factors, the magnitude of benefit from, say, a statin drug would be low, and the magnitude of, of she was the perfect person to try therapeutic lifestyle changes as the first approach. So I think that that's all I'll say about her for now. The next part was uh, Meredith's course, which she came in raving about and which had already started to change her. Thank you. So I'm Meredith, and I'm just going to get this right. Okay. Um, so when Dr. Bernstein joined our clinic, um, about a year ago, we got really excited about uh, the potential and the opportunity we were going to have all of our colleagues at the Osher Center um, to treat migraine and headache patients and uh, really kind of hone in on an integrated approach um, that all of us were doing individually. But then we also, um, in discussions with Dr. Bernstein, decided to start a group and really focus on um, a lot of the different therapies that sometimes are not really um, offered to patients with headaches and migraines. So um, 
So many women, um, well, uh, men too, but uh, it, it, so many more women uh, have migraines, and it really can be an isolating um, experience. And um, so one of the benefits that we felt um, bringing a group together was the shared collective experience um, that people can discuss and get support from. So that was kind of one of our big focuses with starting these workshops. Um, we we bring in different professionals in with our uh, of our colleagues, but um, chiropractic, acupuncture, yoga, craniosacral therapy, uh, nutrition, exercise, um, and different techniques in stress management and pain management, um, as well as mindfulness and meditation. So each session is tailored um, based on what the participants are interested in, and depending on the group, you know, in Sarah's group, a lot of the women had a uh, background in um, meditation already, so we focused um, a little bit more on some of the other other techniques. Uh, we The good thing about a small size group is it can be very fluid, and so we can kind of um, make changes as we go in the curriculum, which is really nice. And I think um, part of our feeling uh, in general is just the more knowledge we can share. You know, knowledge is power, and um, so many times, again, what Dr. Bernstein was describing you know, for patients' experience with migraines and what Sarah will tell you is um, that you feel very powerless. And so some of these techniques that we're able to teach and share with patients um, become a real lifeline. Uh, okay. And the other, um, we really focus on education, very hands-on and practical um, work um, of techniques, which uh, Dr. Kowalski will get into a little bit more. And then this concept of a toolbox. So uh, patients can feel like, um, depending on what symptom they're having, they have a lot of different tools they can apply, um, whether it's acupressure tech or, or a yoga pose or um, self-massage or stretching exercises changing, you know, kind of what they're eating. There's just a lot of different ways that people can relate to that. So uh, just to, to outline very quickly, it's a three-session workshop. Uh, session one is focused on meditation, mindfulness, stress management, and coping. Session two, we do some yoga, uh, musculoskeletal education, and self-care techniques with Dr. Kowalski, um, and concepts of acupuncture. And session three is craniosacral therapy and nutrition. We had our session yesterday, and so we end with a smoothie bar, which is very popular, and uh, um, just a nice way to kind of end the course. Um, at, to, at present, we've completed two groups, um, and um, our participants have been all women ages 20 to 60. Um, we are feeling really strongly about the benefit of the support group and sharing best practices. It's not a support group per se, but we find that the group kind of spills out into the waiting room every session, so that's kind of a good sign that people are feeling connected and uh, really sharing ideas with each other, which is really what I was hoping for. Um, and so this sense of support uh, really has been something that we're going to explore even more. One of our um, a woman who was in our first group with Sarah, um, Katie, is a pre-med student at BU, and so she came and met yesterday's um, group two participants and is going to be starting a support group for women that kind of comes out of this. So anyone who's gone through our program um, will be contacted if they want to join the support group. Um, okay, so next up is my colleague, Dr. Kowalski, who's going to talk a little bit more in detail about the hands-on part. Good morning. Uh, I'm just going to give you some snippets of the uh, musculoskeletal component of the program that we put together. Uh, the section that I covered was uh, myofascial and cervicogenic uh, origins of craniofacial pain. And so what we tried to do during this course, uh, this portion of the course, is introduce our patients to some of their pain, pain spots that they really uh, weren't, you know, weren't uh, really associated with very well. Um, and we did it in this overview. We brought the patients through a little bit of spinal anatomy, uh, postures that they might uh, that might be causing some of the, the pains that are triggering their migraines. We talked about cervicogenic origins of migraine headache as triggers or as modulators of, of migraines, focusing on some of the articular and myofascial components. Uh, 
Then we talked about self-treatment strategies, exercises, stretches that they might do, uh, ergonomic supports and things that they could be used to, uh, to reduce some strain on their neck, uh, and then some self-care instruments and tools that, uh, that, are, com that are used out, uh, out in the field. So I took the patients through just an introduction to their spine and uh, just to start out and showed them where some of the painful spots were and tried to make sense of some of the painful spots that they have in their, in their neck and upper back. I had palp that patients palpating the cervical spine and finding that there were tender facet joints that when they compressed it, they weren't, unaware, they, they weren't even aware that those tender spots were there uh, and oriented to, them to what the anatomy was underlying some of those tender spots. We showed them that these, you know, a tender facet joint might trigger muscle tension in the neck and why some of these uh, facet joints might, becoming, uh, might be getting strained and becoming tender uh, and ways to reduce some of that strain. We showed them you know, some of the common causes of muscle and joint strain. We talked about postural strain, be it habitual, work-related, or even sleeping postures that might be putting some strain on their neck, uh, on their neck or head. We talked about microtrauma and microtrauma concepts and uh, it discussed things like fibromyalgia, um, you know, trigger points, and really focused on myofascial trigger points for much of the talk. I showed the patients that there are tender spots that we, that we can make sense of in their upper back and their neck. Common trigger points, for example, in the upper trapezius muscle that when squeezed can refer pain up to the head or to the base of the skull. We had the patients palpate their own muscles, and in some cases palpate each other's, and apply pressure to it as the, the instructors went around the room and showed where some of these trigger points were, compressed them and showed them that, indeed, you know, these, these areas can refer pain, and oftentimes they were part of the patient's pain. Uh, and so many of them just were completely unaware that these tender points were even, uh, even present. We talked to them about muscles like the suboccipital muscles and they can, how they can cause pain radiating around to the head, sometimes into the back of the eye, and some of the triggers of uh, trigger points in these muscles. For example, uh, just using uh, uh, bifocal glasses or tilting their head up and down to look at a computer screen and how that might strain their neck and strain the suboccipital muscles. We had the uh, palpate uh, muscles like the sternocleidomastoid, and very commonly when you compress that muscle, it can cause pain into the ear, into the base of the skull, into the temple, and very commonly it reproduces the patient's headaches, or at least part of their experience of their headaches. And again, it explain that how these might be triggers of their migraine or modulators of their migraines. We taught the patient different treatment strategies for, uh, for self-care, use of uh, devices uh, such as the Theracane uh, or other devices that are out there that can be used to, to self-massage the area. Uh, we had a lot of these instruments in the classroom so the patients could try them out as well. Showed them how simply using a couple of tennis balls wrapped up in a sock and laying on the back and placing it at the, uh, the, the occipital region uh, can be used as a massage tool for the suboccipital muscles and they can roll that out and, and, use, and set up an, an evening routine uh, to self-massage and try to reduce some of the trigger points that they might have. We taught the patient self-massage techniques, for example, uh, compress and stretch techniques where the patients palpate, they find the trigger points, compress them and stretch the muscle as they're, as, they're, as they're squeezing and trying to release some of those trigger points. Those are common tools that we use in the treatment room that can also be used at home as well. We introduced the patients to their paraoral muscles and, um, and you know, many patients had uh, ear pain or paraoral pain. Many had uh, bruxism, they were clenching their teeth at night. Uh, or they has, you know, it's not uncommon to find that there's malocclusion that's triggering uh, the trigger points in the paraoral muscles. So you have the patients palpate the, uh, the masseter muscles, uh, apply compression to commonly rep reproduce pain over the eyes or even into the ears, and the temporalis muscle, and explain to them why a lot of patients you know, with headaches with, will, will tend to want to massage their temples. Well, the temporalis muscle is not an uncommon spot for trigger points, commonly associated with clenching or malocclusion. Uh, and we, we uh, talked about strategies for treatment of that as well. Show the patient how we can apply these stretch and compress techniques to any muscle, including the power oral muscles. For example, applying deep pressure to the masseter while opening the mouth and stretching through the muscle to try to release that. And how we might be able to set up a two to five minute bedtime routine to relax those muscles before they go to bed. And also, of course, to support their neck while they're sleeping. There are lots of pillows, lots of supports out there, um, and we brought in a couple of pillows and discussed you know, the mechanics of some of the pillows and what we're looking for in a good pillow to support your neck. Um, I, I showed them my favorite, which is the, uh, the Jackson Survey pillow, which is uh, just basically a roll that goes beneath the neck, that when anybody puts it under their neck, it's pretty much an ooh-ah moment. They say, okay, that finally relaxes my neck, and how we can actually relax the neck while they're sleeping to take some of the strain off of it.
We also talked about sitting ergonomics and uh, tools and, and supports that can be used, things like a, a, a back hugger support or McKenzie roll or simply a foam wedge. We had the patients try them in the room to see what, what you know, helped them out uh, before they could, so they could go out and purchase that if they needed to, uh, uh, if they're sitting much, much of the time during the day. And then went through a series of exercises. Taught them about uh, uh, postural, release, releasing postural strain through repetitive exercise, how we can use repetitive exercise to remodel soft tissues and reduce some of the strain in the neck and upper back, and also reduce the recurrence of some of these trigger points. For example, this postural relief technique is one that most of my patients will get, and they, they're instructed to perform it 10 seconds every hour in order to try to get that uh, motor engram uh, implanted to, uh, uh, to reduce the postural strain. We had our patients out in the hallways doing exercises, exercises like the wall angels to try to uh, strengthen the scapular retractors, and again, improve postural awareness. So they left for the package of material uh, that had the instructions for the exercises, a lot of these, these trigger point referral patterns, uh, and hopefully we can get them to uh, engage in self-care with that. So I can introduce you to uh, Dr. Megan Searle, who will talk to you about her program. Okay, so Sarah also participated in a group that we ran, an Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Group, or ACT. And I want to tell you a little bit about ACT and um, also a little bit about the, how the group went. So uh, ACT is a transdiagnostic therapy, uh, which means that it is not specifically developed for one condition. It can actually be helpful and effective um, across a number of different conditions. And there, um, it's also empirically supported, which means that there is um, fairly strong research um, for its efficacy in a number of areas. There's strong support for the use of ACT in chronic pain, and ACT can be used both in a group setting and individually. In this case, we decided to use it in a, a group setting. So um, ACT really aims to foster uh, psychological flexibility uh, through committing uh, to live by one's deepest values. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And also to have a broad, be willing to have a broad range of experiences while living by one's deepest values. So um, there, there are also a number of tools that we use um, to help shift perspective, to bring attention back to what is most important, which is um, one's values, and really being present in the moment, not getting caught up in thoughts, not getting stuck in thoughts. Uh, in ACT, we use a lot of metaphor. We also use experiential exercises, and I'll, I'll explain or describe some of those. Um, so uh, starting with the values. So one of the things that um, is really central to ACT is figuring out what is most important um, to a person. So what is deeply important? How, how do you want to live your life at the end of your life? What, what are you going to look back at and feel is most important? And um, some, one way that we talk about that is um, by, uh, by saying, what is the valued direction? that you want your life to go in. Um, and um, so it, it's not necessarily a goal that you're working toward. It's really a direction. Just like uh, in you can go north, you can go in the direction of north, but you never actually get to north. Similarly, you might, um, one of your deepest values might be, for example, to um, live, to be a, a loving spouse. And if you think about it, you, you never really get to the point where you say, well, I'm finally a loving spouse and now I can stop. Um, you're, you're sort of you know, going, this is how you want to live your life if, if it's really one of your deepest values. Um, and this is an example of an experiential exercise and, and a metaphor. Um, so this is the passengers on a bus metaphor. And the idea is that we all have the direction that we're going in, in our lives. Um, and we have our bus that we're, we're riding in. We're the driver, actually. Um, and we're, we're trying to go in a certain direction. Sometimes there are passengers that get on our bus that we don't really like. And sometimes we wish that they would get off the bus, but they don't. Sometimes they don't. And um, so those passengers could be depression. They could be pain. Um, they could be self-doubt. And um, sometimes we can 
we can try and argue with those passengers and say, I don't want you here, go away, get off the bus. And um, sometimes that doesn't really help and sometimes that can actually make things worse. And so um, the idea here is that can we be willing to have these types of passengers on the bus? Can we bring them along for the ride with us if it allows us to go in our valued direction? And so it, it, we talk a lot about are we, what are we willing to experience in order to have the, the kind of life that is really based in values. And then we also work with a number of different uh, tools, including mindfulness, but also um, some cognitive tools that help to um, broaden perspective, shift perspective. And just one example of that would be something like taking a statement um, like, for example, um, I am never going to get better might, might be one, and, and saying instead, I'm having the thought that I'm never gonna, going to get better, trying to inject some space between um, the the belief and um, and the the thought about the belief. So uh, Sarah participated in a group that we ran in this uh, this fall. It was an eleven week group, and it uh, was two hours each at the Osher Center, and it was covered by insurance. And the participants were all people living with um, with chronic migraines. Um, m most of uh, the participants had been living with chronic uh, migraines for somewhere around twenty years. And these are just a few themes that um, came up in the group. Um, so uh, this notion of really um, benefiting from being with other people who understood what it was like to live with chronic pain um, and the experience of isolation and, and invisibility. Um, also, one thing that came up that was uh, very, very interesting and pertinent was um, the interaction between chronic pain and relationships. So how, um, what does it mean to live in with, with chronic pain? And um, how does that change, for example, being in a, a partnership or being a parent, being um, a, a caregiver for aging parents? And, and how, do, how do we navigate those relationships? And then the, just the complexities of um, trying to manage chronic pain, live with chronic pain in our current healthcare system. And so, um, Things that came up um, were ranged from the experience of not not feeling understood, um, not feeling not being believed by healthcare providers, to just the um, practical sort of difficulties of trying to get the the pain medication that you need in in time um, uh, from the in terms of dealing with uh, the managed care system. Um, so at this point, I'm going to stop and I will invite Sarah to come up and share her experience with us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein, for asking me to share today. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history and then uh, the work that I've done at the Osher Center. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so in the third grade, I had my first headache. Um, weeks and months went by, and I would get them daily. They increased in frequency and intensity. I would usually wake up with the feeling of a vice grip squeezing my temples. The more stress and noise I experienced, the worse it got. Every evening, my father would come home and he would ask me the same question. On a scale of one to 10, what number is your pain? By the time I was in the sixth grade, I had to be homeschooled due to my significant number of absences. I began to see many different doctors and specialists. Eventually, they ruled everything else out and I was diagnosed with tension headaches related to stress. I was so disappointed. I wanted something concrete. Even at nine years old, I knew that stress was a very sad diagnosis. It felt like they were telling me, get a new life and maybe you'll be okay. They prescribed me furanol for my headaches when they were really bad, and they gave me daily doses of Tylenol. This was back in the late 80s, so that was pretty common. Thankfully, my headaches all but disappeared by the time I was in high school, and I would only get them occasionally, but they came back when I was in my 30s. They looked different this time. I had symptoms I didn't recognize. One time when I was with my son, who was five years old at the time, we were walking around in government center. I suddenly completely lost my vision. I was so scared. I desperately clung his small, to his small hand, and I taught him how to call my brother on my phone. That was my first experience with an aura. As my vision came back, the pain in my head became excruciating. 
Migraines really took a turn for the worse after two back-to-back -back car accidents seven years ago. I began to have daily headaches. I would commonly experience symptoms such as vertigo, numbness on one side of my body, on my face, and slurred speech. My PCP instructed me every time I had them that I had to go to the hospital, and they would have to rule out a stroke. I was a regular fixture at Mount Auburn Hospital. They never found out that I had a stroke. My migraines have completely changed my life. At their best, they have given me the motivation to eat well, exercise, and take care of myself better. At their worst, they have isolated me and left me in the dark for days at a time. The pain is bad, but it is familiar and one I know how to handle, but it's the suffering that scares me the most. Not knowing if this intense pain will ever diminish, every day waking up wondering, where was I going to hurt? Was I going to get a reprieve? Was I allowed to live my life just for today, or was I going to stay in this black hole? It's exhausting. The amount of thought that it takes to plan an event, even something like today, wondering, am I going to be okay to wake up and come here and speak? Twice, my sons had to move in with my mother so, because I couldn't take care of us. I've had to miss months of work. I've lost friends. And relationships with my family have greatly suffered. It's hard for friends because my time is limited with them and my social skills have diminished due to isolation. Often, the only thing I know how to talk about is pain and recovery. Many doctors and specialists have been helpful in managing my care, but Dr. Bernstein has been the most instrumental. After reading her book in 2011, I scheduled an appointment with her. Her holistic approach gave me hope that I would find a solution. We began to exhaust every class of drug, and we finally settled on Botox injections. The Botox made a significant difference. I basically went from daily headaches to, it would vary, but maybe three to ten a month. That was a huge improvement. But over time, both Dr. Bernstein and I saw that it wasn't enough, that I needed something else. She sent me to a pain neurologist, Dr. Daniel Varda, who was able to help me with different things, but one of the things he did is he had me purchase a TENS unit and infrared light therapy. And if you've met me, I've probably showed you my infrared light therapy because I'm so excited about it. It significantly helps me with my neck, back, and um, shoulder pain, which triggers my migraines. I also began to see Dr. Wooten at the Arnold Pain Center at the Beth Israel for biofeedback. This helped me to learn how to meditate and recognize when my body was at stress. Dr. Donna Levy, the medical director at the Osher Center, has been vital to my overall care with his caring and charismatic approach. He validates my struggles and honors my successes. He recommended that I see a practitioner that specializes in Alexander Technique. I've had six sessions of the Alexander Technique and I've already seen a great improvement in now how I hold my body as well as unseen areas of tension. Meredith Beatonstar led a three-part class that she told you about called Integrative Approach to Headache Man Management. This class was incredibly useful. The amount of information was more than I had compiled in 10 years of my own research. I was absolutely amazed. Some of the lessons that especially resonated with me was the information about sleep and electronic screen use, how to incorporate exercise while being bedridden, minis, which is short meditation and mindfulness practices, um, Dr. Kowalski actually touched upon a lot of the things I was going to say, um, but one thing that really helped was something he taught us was a wall angel. And he told us that if we did this every day for a few weeks, our bodies would start to change. So I did it. I was good at doing homework, and um, that's when I saw Dr. Levy right afterwards. I was blown away. My rolled shoulders were still rolled, but they weren't as much. And this was the beginning where I realized that the relationship I had with my body had such a large impact on my migraines. I recently completed a class, ACT, which Megan was telling you about. This is an 11-session class. Megan would lead us through guided meditations as well as give us homework to practice mindfulness. She taught us to take action in a valued direction while experiencing difficult life challenges. In other words, what was important to me? What did I want my life to stand for? How do I continue to move forward while still experiencing pain? This was huge for me. It was exactly where I was at in my recovery. I had already been told by multiple doctors that I was on the right track. But now I could just keep on doing what I was doing. The only thing that was left was to accept where I was at and to live my life to the fullest. The class helped me change my perspective, and I noticed that my pain, that at times where it used to be maybe a 6 out of 10, I used to be in bed. Now I was actually able to work for short periods of time, 
and had a greater sense of peace and joy. The other benefit was we had this small, great group of women that bonded and encouraged one another. And there's a couple of them that came here today, which is pretty cool. Um, we actually love the group support and materials so much that Megan agreed to start a second session with us in February. Since I began to incorporate integrative medicine to live my life, I've started telling myself, stop waiting until I'm at 100% health. If all I have is 40%, then make sure it's the best 40%. I'm reminded of a quote by Melody Beattie. She says, many of us are living with handicaps. Some will change over time, but others won't. If that's the case, stop waiting for your handicap to disappear. Instead, decide to live with it. Work around it. Treat yourself with care, with gentleness. Allow yourself to feel and experience all the limitations and emotions of your present situation. Accept them. Let them be part of you, part of your experience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah, for sharing your words with us and, and your uh, experience. We're really grateful. It's a truly uh, both inspiring and educational for all of us. Um, I'd like to invite the team to come up, up front. Uh, um, we have um, uh, a good amount of time for some uh, Q&A. And a and um, as the entire team is coming forth, and, and Sarah, I'd invite you to join too. Um, maybe um, I'm going to ask... Uh, if it's, uh, I'll take the initial um, moderator's prerogative. Um, and Sarah, maybe I'll ask you first. Y you've sort of, um, you've got it, you were able to experience many different modalities and many different approaches, both including pharmacologic management, seeing the specialists, seeing different providers. If there's something about your experience you thought, hmm, as I navigated through this entire system, I would have done this pattern a little bit differently or the order of how you learned these things? Is there something about your experience you may have, in retrospect, now look back and thought it could have been done differently? Um, I, I don't know how I would have done this differently, but it was something that I was noticed while I was putting together this speech was um, when I had first met Dr. Bernstein, one of the things she had recommended multiple times was yoga. She gave me a name of someone, you know, they specialized in this. But I didn't do it. It took me a while. And I kind of I wondered, why did I, I not do it? And I think that there were a couple of factors. And I think that this is important, you know, as a patient, that a medical provider notices that where a person is coming from. So one of the things, the reason I didn't do it was it cost money. Um, it was also, my pain was bad, but it wasn't as bad as it has been in recent years. So I wasn't, you know, pushed to that point. Um, I think also it's important to stress, you know, as a doctor to say, you know, this is the percentage of, you know, we need to do a medication, but this is the percentage of lifestyle, and that's really up to you. And for me, it's easier to, like, it's been so great going to these classes because I, I just know all I have to do is show up. And once I'm there, then they're going to direct me. But when you have to go on your own to do things like yoga or even meditate at home, it's hard. I was also told I had to meditate, and I didn't do that until I started biofeedback. So I think um, it can feel very overwhelming where you're told you know, to do lifestyle changes and this and that, and you don't know which one's really important. And you know, I was a single mom with a kid and exhausted, and it just felt like a lot. So um, I would have done lifestyle changes right from the beginning, but I think I was also in such an acute pain too that it was important to deal with just that. So um, I don't know if that's really mm -hmm. answering sure. the question, but. Yeah, uh, Carrie, did you want to add any f um, words? And I think that's such an excellent point. I have told my colleagues at the Osher Center that it is really exciting to be able to work with them and to be able to have a group of integrative medicine colleagues who can work collaboratively with me around setting up programs like this. And I'm hoping that the groups that Meredith has established and, and that Megan has established, I'm hoping that we can set standards for how we can deliver care both to people with headaches, to people with other kinds of pain, to potentially people with other kinds of neurologic diseases, which is my specialty. I'm a neurologist. I'm a headache specialist. We are hoping to put together a poster to show at the American Headache Society session this year. Um, and we're talking, and I think this is really important and speaks to what you said, how can we collect data, how can we look at the outcomes and the responses of people who participated in these groups and really study what the effects are on their 
headaches on their medical illnesses understand that. And then there's a, a piece that um, we talk about in, in medicine specifically that I think many of you are familiar with, the translational piece. How can we understand the science of what it's like to be in a group like this? How does it really change Sarah's experience of pain? How does it actually change her headaches? We have tools that we're beginning to use. We're beginning a, a chiropractor migraine research project for which we're very excited. We've been funded to, be, to begin to work on that. But I feel like these kinds of groups and this kind of, of collaboration allow me, it's, it's a really a, a genuine dream to be able to offer people like Sarah something that where I, I don't have to say, okay, go to Cambridge and do this yoga and go here and do this meditation, but instead, come to the Osher Center and participate in a group with a beautifully, thoughtfully designed curriculum that, that my colleagues and I have all worked on together. And I, I joke a little bit with, with all of you, but, but I mean it when I say I'm the first embed specialist to be part of this group. It's a tremendous opportunity. And that, that slide that I showed about you know these kinds of treatments really gaining traction, as we all learn, opiates are not the answer for, for pain in particular, but for a lot of different medical conditions, although they may be part of it, but how can we bring people together with this shared experience that, that we addressed, teach these coping techniques, and then teach specific strategies? And so every bit of feedback that we get from you, I want us all to think about it and, and, and talk about it and figure out how can we do this better and better and actually get it to the place where we can check off a box when, and write a medical order and say, okay, participate in integrative medicine toolbox for migraines. This is part of your treatment in addition, not replacing, not one or the other. But as you really beautifully described, this has been a, a holistic part of your care that's gotten you to a better place. Great. Thank you. Um, again, and we're inviting questions from the audience as they um, I, uh, so raise your hand. Uh, but I wanted to actually have a follow-up question, uh, and this is more directed to perhaps Matt and Don. You know, how do we, uh, both from the clinical perspective and the research dimension of this, how, how are you thinking about how patients are triaged amongst a, when you have a, a system of multiple providers of different modalities, how, how do you conceptualize how, uh, both thinking about it clinically as well as how you're thinking about studying that? And maybe I'll proactively ask Peter to comment after this. I think triage in all medicine is, is really an interaction with the patient. It's a patient-doctor connection, figuring out what's the next step for this person, which makes it very difficult to study. And so many of the interventions we do, someone has back pain and we have three different approaches because this person, for example, um, is scared to death of needles. So I guess that rules out acupuncture for the moment. But and chiropractic might be terrible, they've heard, until they've met Dr. Kowalski, uh, or it's just not the right fit right now. So it's a really big read on the person, and that makes it, I guess, a difficult issue to study because I don't think any two people have gone the exact same path that I've seen for the same diagnosis. Something that has been unique about our group is some cross-training that we've all done. We, we meet a couple of times a month. Uh, we discuss patients, we, we consult by walking around, and uh, we also do it in a group setting. Uh, but we had a lot of um, uh, collabor collaboration within the group prior to even opening the clinic so that you know, we could start to, you know, a chiropractor could start to think like a, an OT or, you know, an OT could start to think like a massage therapist. And so we'd have some of that uh, uh, cross-training mindset uh, so that it shouldn't matter where the patient begins in many instances as long as we're, we have the right mindset and get the patient to the right practitioner, uh, ours isn't, our, our approach isn't about, isn't about the uh, sustainability of our profession, but the, the benefit of the patient. Uh, so, you know, if we can put the patient in the center there and if our care isn't working or something's different, we have a team of people that we can work with and collaborate with uh, for the best of patient care. Yeah. Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can briefly say something about the challenges to research with this kind of a model, I think the traditional model is a very reductionist one where we <clears throat> have a very set of, excuse me, of specific mechanisms and we know what the, the therapeutic intervention is and we focus on that specifically. I think here it's more of a sort of top-down black box model where people come in and each patient is different and they're in a different place um, in their history of migraines 
and there's a set of options, and they move through the system, and they pick and choose in different ways. And I think the first phase, and this is what we've done for back pain in our clinic, is to study the team and how the average person moves through that. And I think once we have a sense of the effectiveness of that approach, and thousands of patients or hundreds of patients that have gone through there, we may start to see fingerprints of a certain type of person moves through this and they respond to that, and that that might in, uh, inform the types of more mechanistic research we do. But I think at first, um, does a, a well-thought program like, like Carrie was talking about with a team that really understand each other, is that an effective tool to add to what's available? And then once we've done that, I think we can drill down a little deeper and start to figure out how to navigate people through that and understand um, more of the mechanisms. Yeah. Question for Dr. Kowalski about the, you mentioned cervicogenic headache, and that's an interesting term because, um, I, could you comment a little bit about what is known and perhaps not known about how um, issues related to muscle tension in the neck may impact it's easy to understand how this might impact tension headaches, but what about migraine? What do we know about that? My, my, um, what, I, what I explain to patients is that we're, we're not approaching this from, from a perspective of trying to, to treat migraine, but some of the modulators of migraine, uh, that the, you know, uh, an irritated facet might trigger some muscle tension, mus muscle pain, that could refer pain into their head. Um, and our, our goal is not necessarily to treat the... the um, the origin of the migraine, or the, the pathophysiology of the migraine, but to reduce and re, reduce all of these uh, triggers and provide them a little bit of a buffer zone. Uh, and if we can do that through a musculoskeletal approach plus a nutritional approach, yeah, I think we can slowly you know, increase that threshold uh, that, that triggers the patient into a migraine. So we do know that there are, there are you know, the, the myofascial structures and the facet joints can all trigger head pain uh, and craniofacial pain. And so I find it to be one component. And there's another piece of this as well. The patients with migraines will also commonly say that, you know, I've got the migraines and I have daily headaches as well. Uh, and in, uh, this approach will commonly allow us to reduce the daily headaches uh, and, and, again, provide them a better buffer zone. Is there a thought also about this might help people get a hold of that anticipatory anxiety? I forget who talked about that. I guess it was Carrie, you know, feeding into that cycle of, of fear that the migraine will happen? Oh, sure. And just that fear will trigger muscle tension as well uh, that, that, that many people don't even know is, uh, is, is present until you put a finger on it. And many people have never put a finger on it. And it's not uncommon to be one of the first practice. Actually, it's, it's what's really common to hear is that Dr. Bernstein was the first one who actually put a finger on my pain uh, and was able to provoke it, uh, that nobody actually touched you know, my neck or, or, or my head before. Uh, and, and they started to learn that there were those connections. So, Thank you. Uh, uh, Meredith, can you comment to maybe just give a few sentences on, on thinking about what are the nutritional strategies that you chose to talk about in the context of migraine management? So um, we were really lucky that Caitlin was able to join us, our nutritionist at the uh, Osher Center. Um, so um, certainly um, she talked a lot about, a little bit about triggers. I think a lot of people in our groups had already um, kind of identified uh, certain triggers that they had for migraines. But um, she also just really looked at the full um, kind of nutrition, uh, what people eat on a daily basis and kind of some myths around um, certain foods that, you know, um, people had questions about. Um, yesterday, for instance, was our nutrition part of the workshop. And so um, she talked about um, maintaining blood sugar and having small meals during the day with a healthy balance of fat and protein um, and really um, encouraged people to kind of look at the whole, like how they're eating in general, not just, you know, um, for a lot of people with migraines, comfort food is really important in, in the midst of a terrible headache and so um, not to beat yourself up about that but to you know when you need what is it a Cinnabon is the <laughs> is the key like a Cinnabon happens to have like the perfect ratio of comfort food for a lot of people I think Carrie just said um, what people crave a lot if she had to like, name the number one but uh, it's okay to have like a, a sliver of that if that's how you're feeling but to really look at you know the big picture of 
um, what your nutrition is over um, the day, the week, the month. Um, and then we we did the smoothie bar, which was really fun. And, you know, even I, I, who I think I'm a healthy eater, but I think a lot of us have more sugar than we think. And so we used a lot of vegetables in our smoothie with just a couple of sweet um with a couple of sweet um, fruits and, you know, just kind of explored that and talked about really everything to do with diet. So it was really an interesting um, perspective for, I think. Can I just add one thing? The Headache Cooperative of New England has a really nice statement about nutrition and migraines, which basically says we don't really understand why some of these food triggers um, have been propagated for people with migraines and that Oftentimes, it's not one distinct trigger for every single migraine patient, but it's a lot of individual work to tease it out. But basically, sometimes with the restrictive diets, we can harm our patients more than we can help them. And I've had people come in who are living on yogurt and a banana, and I I mean, that's the most restrictive one I've ever seen. But what I loved about what Caitlin was saying at the session, I was able to sit in on part of it yesterday, was she was talking about the anti-inflammatory diet, the Walter Willett diet, where we're really olive oil, fruits, vegetables, the Mediterranean diet. So just emphasizing, and I think this is true for everybody, but in particular for people who have an ongoing pain condition, medical condition, you want to give your body as many tools as you can to defend. You want to be as as well-fed as possible. And she did this in a really nice, very clear way with a lot of practical examples and then made smoothies for everybody with spinach, cucumbers, ginger, beets, um, you weren't there. What, what yeah. else? Yeah, hazelnuts. And you know what? Um, it was different than anything I had ever tried. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was eye-opening. And, and I think that was, that was really great. So there was this real um, ability with, I think, all the sessions with the group, every single thing that was done that I thought was so unique to really, like, like you described so beautifully, just to give people very specific tools and things that they can do without having to search all over the place or go all over the place. And so people would walk out with really good recommendations and techniques that they had learned and had the chance to practice. And I think that that, the nutrition piece was really part of that. Here. Yeah. Good. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Bernstein and uh, Dr. Levy. Um, Sometimes I got, you know, I have some um, headache patient and sometimes I recommend to do acupuncture what well, this you know discussion i think acupuncture didn't really show up because uh, sarah say to you she's afraid of the needle no i just said in general if a person says they're afraid of needles we talk about it a bit but it's silly to start there but acupuncture is the first bit of advice i also whenever someone has tried acupuncture i or, or wants to i say you should go to the practitioner and ask for a plan how, long, how many sessions will it take before we have a sense of whether this is working? And when are we going to reevaluate? And in what state and what intervals should we continue to reevaluate? Because I've heard of people going for acupuncture and come back and tell me, well, I tried it for nine months. And I'm thinking, nine months? Uh, w- why? After five, six, seven, 12 visits, it would have been more than enough to just about any acupuncturist I know to say, I think we ought to do something else. Uh, one final question, uh, Megan, I just wanted to ask you, as we think about, and if you can just really succinctly um, think about the multitude of group-based approaches like ACT, MBSR, uh, resiliency, different resiliency programs, is there a triage uh, mechanism that you think about uh, between uh, patients' appropriateness? And I know maybe it's a bigger question that we will extend into our coffee hour, um, but uh, if you can give just a, a quick one or two sentences of how you think about that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think, um, I mean, one thought is I think it's important to look at the literature and what that, that says um, and, and look at what types of approaches have empirical support. Um, but I, I'm not sure that we have, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we have a, a great answer um, at this point. Um, I mean, I would, uh, so I, I think to, for me it feels like an op- open question. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much to uh, all of our presenters and our and our patients. Uh, very very much. Uh, 
I just want to take say a quick word about our next grand rounds in uh, in January, and this is going to be January. What's the date? Third. Third. Uh, this is going to be a special grand rounds. It's going to be a town hall meeting. So what we want to do at this town hall meeting is we want to hear from all of you. We want to get your feedback as to. Um, uh, I'm curious. As did, how many of you were at our forum, Integrative Medicine Forum? Oh, like uh, quite a few. Okay. So we had our Integrative Medicine Forum a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we've been getting a lot of people answering our surveys, post-event surveys. We're getting an idea of what how people uh, responded to that, uh, this, this wonderful gathering that we had. But we want to be able to keep going forward, and this is a time of the year where we start making our plans for the next year. We want to hear from all of you as to how we are doing, what is the state of our clinical network, of the clinical integrated medicine network in Boston. And so we want to really have an open discussion about that. Um, I'm going to be you know, presenting you data you know, uh, gathering from our uh, network, both the research network and the clinical network that we're starting to collect. It's very exciting. And so um, that's going to be what we're going to be doing. So I hope we see all of you uh, on January 3rd.